Chmai, Hui Abigail Chibitnoi, Pennsylvania Mi Shu Fianga, Manaka Valerie, Papaka Robert, Pennsylvania Mi Shu Liatuk, Ilanka Germany Mute, Chali Tanikhanak Nek, Chali Una Nek, Koyana Dadi and Columbia for inviting me out here. Um, thank you. I begin with an abbreviated introduction in my language, which I'm still learning, and as many of uh, my tribal members are still learning. And this introduction I share with you is rooted in attention to relations and my relations and the places we belong to and that we're from. I was raised in a landlocked state with a family myth of water. Before I knew anything, I knew I was descended from salmon fishers and that somewhere off the shores of Alaska, there was an island of my relatives. There was an island where I was related to everyone on it. And it didn't matter that I was afraid of the ocean, the weight of waves breaking on fragile spines, the propensity for sand to seek one's open mouth in the surf, those storied riptides that carried you to sea before anyone could reach you, or creeper waves that rose with unexpected might that I had dreams of before I had names to call them by. It didn't matter that my early relationship to water was memory of being held under. Because the waters around my island were too cold and strong to be entered, I wasn't expected to swim to survive. Still, they were mine, or rather, more accurately, I was theirs by proximity. I was theirs despite my own displacement. Water gets around like that. With settlement funds from the infamous Valdez Exxon oil spill, the Olympic Museum and Archaeological Repository in Kodiak was able to take control of its own narrative and develop revitalization movements that enabled the community to reclaim pride in their heritage and relearn their language, and created a channel by which wayward descendants such as myself might navigate passage home. Um, here I should clarify, since I'm used to the introduction, that though I am a member of the Tanehanak village and my family still has roots in Kodiak, Alaska, I grew up in Pennsylvania as a result of the Carlisle Indian Schools assimilation program. My great-grandfather was taken there as a boy and never got to return home. So chief among this, uh, these Olympic revitalization projects is the Word of the Week archive and podcast that allows users to search for a word. And it will then pull every Olympic entry that matches that word, assuming your search is in English, uh, whether it be the word in the entry, the word in the example sentence, or even in the micro essay that accompanies the word, or in the metadata for the images in the word. It'll pull up every entry that even includes word in the caption. Search water. Tachminek Tangak Atur Kaput. We use water in everything. Imam Tanga Tariyutuk. The ocean's water is salty. Tangak ituk, the water is deep. Chumi fat lishngatalit, the ancestors were very learned. And here you can see the only reference to water when I pull up this search is that metadata of the water color of the image. Words spill into phrases sweep me to other words, other phrases, until I've collected enough in a pool to feel like I am supiak, a real person. After all, it's these channels I've been exploring in my poetic practice lately. They lead me home, yes, but indirectly. Water pools like that. In suggestion, the Aleutic language, the word for sea is imok. It is also the word for contents, or a liquid contained inside. 
Imatuk means it is full. Imetuk, it is empty. Imasuchtwa, how we say I am sad, translates directly to I am searching for my contents, or if we extend contents to see, is to be sad is to be searching for the sea. I'm not sure that I believe water remembers us, but we remember the water. Here's another. To be pregnant is imamuk. She is filling up. And the word for nostrils is pajikwak, or gill-like things. Our bodies, our tongues, remember water. Landlocked and terror-bound as I am, I am also nowhere more at home, more at ease, nowhere prone to get grinning like an idiot, as on water. Though I prefer the protection of lakes and reservoirs, or at the very least the comfort of a bigger boat. The wind still creates disturbances if the fetch is sufficient. And sometimes one must cease paddling to catch one's balance before resuming forward motion. But it is enough to simply be out on the water, to be faced with a horizon of water. The word for sea, imak, is also found in the words for whale lover, kimak, ring finger, kilimak, middle finger, akulimak, and salmon, alimak. And these are just the words I could locate as a novice to my language, stolen from my great-grandfather in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. The language we use, the poems we read, influence how we see the world and our understanding of what is possible. Like ocean waves, the Aleutic language is accretive. It builds on itself. Imok, imamek, imatahmek. The sea, from the sea, always from the sea. It takes some time to fit your throat, to wrap your mouth around the sound. When I was writing my first book, someone asked me where all the women were, and I didn't have an answer then. But like the water, I find them in language. Ahnat huime etut. Arnat imame etut. Ahnat taname el shmiana. It's about the relationships we build and that we recognize. Kahwach tochniuk. The current is strong, it delivers many things. Search current. Kahwach tochniuk. Maskak chulong kutuk, the mask has feathers. Kalumak kanake sulutamak, my ring is made of gold. Katayat ner nuch tatu, gulls will eat anything. Achnat kut me etut, which is one of the phrases I spoke earlier and chose not to translate um, here, means the women are at the beach. An ocean current is a continuous directed movement of seawater generated by a number of forces acting upon the water, including wind, which, not a river, is prone to impulse, to fractal waves as a course of action. The Coriolis effect, Fictitious, fictitious force by which one is felt to be left behind, breaking waves, cabling, in which two parcels mix to form a third that sinks below both parents, and differences in temperature, saltiness, and density, by which one surely sinks now and again. The currents it would take to send my line home must first traverse around the whole earth. A flat model won't do, but a rising tide might. I don't believe the future holds a lack of water so much as an overabundance. 
Ocean waves transport energy over vast distances, although the water itself doesn't move, except up and down. Past the rigors, the vessel stills. One theory of how freak waves are formed in the deep ocean is based on a non-linear superimposition of other waves of different wavelengths, whereby the resulting height is more than just the sum of all the heights of the waves that go to make it up. The obvious influence in my own work is the imagery, but perhaps less obvious and more relevant to why I'm throwing all of these alluding terms on, on the slides here, is how images coexist and transform the work by uh, accretion and association, much like the elutic language. A search for a single word is demonstrated summons dozens, and the relationship between them is not always apparent. Current builds connections and pathways that are circuitous and meandering, taking in sediment and droplets from each shoreline they have swept by. Wreckage from a tsunami in Japan washes up on California's shores. The earth shakes in Alaska, and a small fish in a well in the desert feel the disturbance. It is a poetics of juxtaposition and transformation, one that demands both that one submerges fully in the medium and that one remembers to come up for air. Never turn your back on the water, signs of the beach worn. It is fluid in its movements, but unmatched in its power of change, its ability to be held and break on the shore. Rivers, too, press against their banks, divide and unite, give and take. In August 2017, the body of Savannah LaFontaine Greywind was found in the Red River in North Dakota. In 2014, the body of 15-year-old Tina Fontaine, no direct relation, was found in the Red River in Manitoba. Disposal of victims in water is a common tactic used by assailants as water often washes away forensic evidence necessary for conviction. I don't see a future without water. I see a water horizon that is rising. Droughts, yes, but elsewhere floods, rising tides, rising voices. Scarcity and abundance and in a framework of resource extraction where land is viewed as bounty to be taken, a similar framework applied to views of women and indigenous people, and especially indigenous women, results in increased violence and rape. From an article in Ecologist, quote, mining corporations bring a lot of male aggression into regions where women and children become the targets of violence, trafficking, and prostitution, if not outright murder, as is the case in North America's missing and murdered indigenous women, end quote. And I've experienced the impact of this on communities directly with the Mandan Hidatsa, a river nation in North Dakota, right by the Bakken oil field where my consulting company works. Ahnat tanami etut, the women are in the water. There are inseparable systemic links between the climate crisis, today's global economic model, and the ongoing exploitation and disempowerment of women. Globally, when our profit-driven society sees indigenous peoples blocking progress, or rather profits, as they fight to defend their homes and livelihoods and assert their rights simply to continue to exist, they are swept away violently, and we, in our well-lit, climate-controlled, cozy, albeit possibly concerned, bubbles don't even blink. We hardly hear about it. Language shapes our perspective, and the way we speak of the earth as a resource to be exploited is similar to the exploitation of indigenous women, especially in places heavily invested in resource extraction. Women, water, the land are viewed as commodities. They are finite resources to be wrestled and won, to be tamed and benefited from ad infinitum. A poetics of water is one that returns agency, one that pushes the narrative in a new direction, that rushes to erase, or rather fill, the space between these issues, to bridge the divide through language. When there were bad storms and heavy seas, traditionally the elutic men in their skin boats would lash their boats together, and leave them to the forces of the waves. Of course poets can't save the planet, not by ourselves, 
For that, we need scientists and policymakers willing to listen. But poets can help shape the narrative, can show us a myriad of visions forward we can take, can direct our gaze and reveal possibilities and make connections not previously imagined. Large numbers of strangers can cooperate successfully by believing in common narrative. In indigenous cultures, we use stories to teach survival. And that is how we will weather the storm and how we will row the boat ashore. Long ago, they say, our people and their boats started on a trip young and returned old, but not even then found the end of the earth. We live in the water. Thank you. Seeing a mark that indicated how high the water will be in 
New York in 2080 made the exhibition's goals particularly vivid and intimate. The idea of measuring the water rising ended up being the backbone for my poem, When the Water is at Our Ankles, which is illustrated with this image of a ruler underwater. In it, the speaker talks to her lover about the water rising at a greatly accelerated rate, and along with other New Yorkers, tries to implement plans to slow the water rising when it's already much too late. I use details from some of the artists and architects' plan in the poem, sinking retired subway cars into the rivers, adding artificial islands, and also invented a few others. This is the poem. When the water is at our ankles, unwedge the ruler you use to prop up your window and meet me in the street. I'll bring the measuring tape curled in the desk drawer like a sullen snail, and hand in hand, we'll watch up as the water creeps up an inch, then two. The river's a baby, it's a toddler, it's grown. The lecture series never made it past puddles. When the water is at our knees, will someone please pick a plan? Plan A, a fleet of sunken subway car reefs where fish with oil-clogged gills can find some relief hovering in the newly calm water as eels coil around silver poles still smeared with commuters' coughs and fingerprints. When the water is at our waists, plan B, let loose the artificial islands, one squirrel per. Also the giant lily pads and the piles of ash some of us have been saving for this occasion. When the water is at our shoulders, the officials will roll out the boulders and we'll throw our bonsais in the river to simulate that underground forest they said might help. A miniature misplaced effort, it's true. Our codicil to plan C is a bust. Years of scrupulous sniffing, my bristly little juniper, your tiny sugar maple, sink with nary a bottle or clank of ceramic pot hitting rock. Someone's child goes bobbing by in a flotation device made of empty milk jugs and water wings. A dog, no two, go under. Now, as the last bit of ice melts and the water laps at the balconies, it's too late for plans D through Z, the oyster extravaganza, the lobster boats piled high with biscuits, all those dear dioramas with their rescue dramas, and baby blue waves the size of a dog's hand that approach but never reach our once dry land. Water is changeable, as are people and perhaps particularly poets. So of course we are intrigued by a substance that can turn from vapor to liquid to solid, freezing, evaporating, falling from the sky, sinking into the ground. Additionally, as Dottie mentioned, we ourselves are made of water. We wake up, shower in it, pour it into our coffee makers, walk out into a day full of hovering clouds, clouds which contain 0.04% of the world's fresh water. My obsession with water currently resides in the clouds. For the past five years, I've been working on a book titled All of the Above, which is about taxonomies, thinking about how we humans love to try to categorize the uncategorizable, boxing in changeable objects and identities like clouds and gender. It's also turning out to be about face blindness and Napoleon's older brother, but today I'm gonna to focus on clouds and the idea of bringing them from the background to the forefront. How did the clouds get their names? In the Bible, Adam gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field, but he doesn't name the clouds. The names we know clouds by today were coined by chemist and amateur meteorologist Luke Howard in a lecture he gave to the Askesian Society in a basement in London in 1803. His first classifications included cirrus or thread cloud, cumulus or heat cloud, stratus or level cloud, and cumulocirrus stratus or rain cloud. In 1817, he revised and added to his categories. I should mention that in the Askesian Society, they did things like inhaling nitrous and floating around together as an experiment. <laughs> John Constable, one of our most famous cloud painters, used to go outside to study the clouds and make quick sketches of them. In a letter he wrote, I have done a good deal of skying. I decided to go skying with the Kardashians, focusing on the reality of the sky in an artificial reality show. They, or maybe their production team, seem truly obsessed with clouds. And I currently have about two 
2000 Kardashian cloud Polaroids, stills from the TV show. For me, keeping up with the Kardashians became keeping up with the clouds. The Kardashians faded into the background, though it must be said they are changeable like clouds themselves, swelling with pregnancy, losing weight, gaining weight, plumping their lips, starting to look more and more like one another thanks to plastic surgery, changing hair colors and borrowed clothes. And the clouds moved to the foreground, becoming the real stars of the show. When a cloud I haven't seen before, they do repeat clouds, but only within seasons. My eyebrows shoot up, registering new cloud before my brain has even processed that fact. Part of how we interact with the natural world is in naming, so I set out to name the Kardashian clouds. At first, I only photographed sky scenes, but I quickly began noticing clouds reflected in other things, things that looked like clouds but weren't, clouds appearing in paintings and on walls. In trying to follow Luke Howard's example, I've divided my Kardashian clouds, or Bube's Kardashianum, into four categories. Real clouds, fierce, false clouds, falses, simulated clouds, pinkus, and art clouds, artists, with further subdivisions. I don't know Latin, but given the part that Latin played in making Howard's cloud taxonomy a success, other scientists tried to have their own taxonomies, but Latin was the fashion then, so they failed. So I transited them with the help of a friend. The first category is real clouds or virus. So here you see some regular old clouds. Um, this one shows a cumulonimbus, stratocumulus, nimbostratus, and stratus. But I may be wrong about some of these because distinct distinctions such as strato, alto, and nimbo have to do with the cloud's height and whether it is about to produce rain. And that is hard, sometimes hard to calculate in real life and on television. However, as CJP Cave reassuringly put it in his book, Clouds and Weather Phenomena for Artists. Quote, one frequently sees clouds that even a trained meteorologist would have difficulty putting into one class or the other. The Kardashian sunset clouds tend to be quite spectacular and so receive their own subcategory, Virus, Bocasa Solis. Often the Kardashians appear in front of actual clouds. Here, Virus gets a subcategory of reflected clouds or repercussi, which are further subdivided into what they are reflected in, such as building clouds or edificia. I was excited to see the clouds boxed in by the grid of the building's window, as if my idea of my classification had sprung to life. A further subcategory of reflected clouds is clouds in car windows, auto sinetti fenestra, and plane windows, aeroplane fenestra. The plane window in a rare one is on the lower right hand side. Like most celebrities, who are themselves a special subcategory of Homo sapiens, the Kardashians love to wear sunglasses, so I began photographing the moments when clouds were reflected in their sunglasses. Thus, we have re repercussive oculi or clouds reflected in eyes. And here we have various repercussive aqua or reflections in water. I caught what seems like Chris Jenner accidentally pointing at a cloud in a swimming pool. <laughs> We're always comparing clouds to other things. Look, that cloud looks like a camel, a sailboat, a UFO. So I thought to write that balance by comparing other things to clouds. These were the most fun to hunt down. False clouds or falses. Things that look like clouds but aren't. It makes my words wallow watching you keeping up with the Kardashians even more challenging. Because even when the Kardashians are inside, there's always a chance of a falsus. Um, here are some steam clouds. Uh, stop this space that is being blurred by pasta steam. Uh, when the Kardashians are, Kardashians are in New York City, the filmmakers tend to feature the urban clouds that we frequently encounter in winter, steam rising from the striped orange construction tubes. On the lower right is steam rising from steamed crabs. Another subcategory of falsus are terme or back clouds. The top left image may be my all time favorite falsus. It's Kylie rinsing her newly dyed blue hair in the sink, subcategorized as keyless or hair cloud. Next, we have what appears to be a cloud appearing from inside a shopping bag, titled Papyrus Regulus or tissue paper cloud. And lastly, from a demonstration about tampons given to the very young Kendall and Kylie by their older sisters, a tampon floating cumulus-like in a glass. Tampon is another word we don't have a precise Latin word for, so I went with woman tissue cloud. 
More than any family I've encountered, the Kardashians enjoy food fights, hence the category Sebus. I wonder if this is because they live in such a state of polished perfection, spending hours in hair and makeup before they film their family interactions, endlessly renovating their new houses. Perhaps they feel boxed in by their tight dresses, their spotless kitchen counters, their pristine pools with neutral pool furniture, their airbrushed skin. Somewhere inside, I think they want to make a mess. These are images from a sour cream food fight between Chloe and Courtney, featuring a very fetching cumulus on top of Courtney's head, subcategory cremor, acerbus, or sour cream. This page shows Kris Jenner after being attacked with pies by Kim and Courtney, and on the lower level in an earlier incident, her daughters have poured yogurt, black acidum, on her head while she is sleeping. Another type of falsus is um, here, subcategory palace or fur. This is when Kanye outfitted the Kardashian clan in white and pink fur jackets. And then this is, we're actually having some new exciting dogs. They've gotten a lot of dogs in recent years, but these were uh, some older dogs uh, also. Category Connus. So I'm just gonna page through a few more of these to give you, uh, you can see a sonogram, ice bath, pillow, They know that a cloud, so now we're moving into uh, Fingus. Uh, the Kardashians know that a cloud adds drama to any situation. These I named Fingus or simulated clouds. The top two images are clouds of smoke, subcategory Fume, as the Kardashians enter a charity boxing event, followed by Kim wearing wings emerging from clouds of smoke, and lastly, Chris, Chris with a beautiful cloud of cigarette smoke at a club. As Eric Sloan notes, quote, you puff a cigarette cloud of cumulus shape. If you smoke enough, there will be a stratus cloud shape hovering in the room. The top two images are club scenes. There's also no Latin word for club, so I chose festival or gratulatio. To my great delight, this Kanye concert featured him appearing on stage under a simulated cloud. So I bestowed upon him his own subcategory of Kanye. The last category of Mubis Kardashianum is art clouds or artium, clouds that appear in paintings, photographs, murals, etc. From top left, we have Scott and Lauren Marr getting fitted for suits with a cloud photograph in the background, cloud art with text overlay, and two views of Kardashian screensavers featuring clouds. Here I got very excited when uh, Rob, Courtney, and Scott go shopping for baby items in a store that is wallpapered in clouds. This is at Soul Cycle. <laughs> and here we have um, the top right is uh, Las Vegas. I knew about this mural in, in the hotel, so I was hoping they would go there, and they did go twice. And this is Baby Mason with some cloud blanket. <laughs> um, this is just, they actually had this as a uh, backdrop that they used on uh, Chris, or what is it, Chloe, Chris, Courtney, go to Miami. They all get mixed up. Do I make too much of this Kardashian obsession with clouds? Possibly. They themselves rarely mention the clouds, except in this one moment when Chris says to Courtney and Chloe, look at the clouds, you guys, just so beautiful, and takes a photograph. <laughs> then again, what about the fact that this happens? Kim emerges from the clouds. Surely this supports my suspicion that reality stars have become or aim to become our new gods. For now, I'm trying to invert this. I'm making the clouds the focus of my attention, and this sort of silly artistic exercise is changing the way I look at the world. I read articles about clouds and climate change. I turn away from my phone and look up at the sky. I don't think poets can save the world through our poetry. That was another sweetly optimistic question posed by Dottie. But writing poems and making art is a form of paying attention to the world that can invigorate our desire to vote, donate, protest, and through those avenues, maybe we can.
hungry thirst for its reflection and reaction. That I should turn on the tap and worry, perhaps, about my building's old place, but not about the water itself. That be not miles but dimensions away from the horrors of Flint of Baltimore. In my mind's eye, a line of women carrying tubs of water top their heads just outside the car. I had thought that the TV and in the restaurants had been too expensive to correspond with the lack of basic infrastructure. But this is not true. There's light in the soil at Prospect Park and the fountains at, of, in the water of fountains at Brooklyn College. We, too, are steeped in failed governance. So I was thinking about some of the questions um, we received also. And I know so little about water. Um, so to me, to take after water, to reflect on water, demands that I first confront my own reflection, our subjectivities, our changing forms at every moment, political and economic contexts. That I attempt to do this on fraught land. I wish to acknowledge the Lenape as the first people of New York, to acknowledge my writing from within the empire, its many layered permutations, from within the empire state, unceded indigenous land. When the Dutch arrived in 1609, this island was surrounded by salt water. It boasted of two dozen streams and four dozen ponds, wolves, bears, mountain lions, 70 kinds of trees, 30 kinds of orchids. Broad Street, Maiden Lane, Mineta Street, Sixth Avenue consisted of fresh water. Central Park and Times Square were prominent beaver colonies, and uh, there were, of course, lots of beavers on Beaver Street. Before I marked the border between Chinatown and Soho, Canal Street traced the canal. In a hole left by a glacier, the water seeped into collect ponds. Slaughterhouses, tanneries, and breweries dumped their waste into it so that it was heavily polluted and spreading cholera by 1800. By 1821, city officials drained the pond and covered the canal. The point that used to be Paradise Square became five points connecting Chinatown with city administrative buildings, the Manhattan Detention Complex, the tombs. The apparition of the glacier, of the apparition of the hole, of the apparition of the pond. These haunt the tombs. Uh, this moment stays with me, so I'll stay with it. I remember attending a United Nations meeting where an indigenous leader spoke about how official governmental protection of the land was anything but. The government opened up her community's land to oil companies and paramilitary groups. When she went on to talk about intergenerational trauma, the presiding rapporteur interrupted. Excuse me, but your intervention is not smart. I gasped. Um, and it took me a while to realize that the rapporteur was actually referring to an acronym that her testimony was not smart, specific, measurable, action-oriented, relevant, time-sensitive. Intergenerational traumas are not smart because they lack a contained shape, because they cannot be addressed by specific individuals who can sue and name as racist, because they are pervasive and seep into our dreams as well as our nightmares. State institutions claim that they are too amorphous, that they do not merit attention. What does critical resistance look like for us with little institutional, financial, formal power? What would it mean to escape the constraints of institutional shapes and legal containers, to take after water, to use water to recognize trauma, to be so invaluable and ubiquitous as to be taken for granted, to cradle each of us even before we were born in utero? I always forget that in Chinese culture, one is born at age one, in order to account for our time suspended in amniotic fluid. Even now, nearly half of the Hudson River's waters from here to Troy is considered a precious tidal estuary where salt and fresh waters meet. We became a global city partly by building along, using, and polluting these waters. That water begins with the deception that it, it is here to accommodate, it is spineless, it has no memory. What if, even as it's always taking on a different shape, 
It retains the memory of experience through its many lives and cycles of evaporation and condensation. I want to honor and honor water's memories, its triumphs and traumas, to the sacrifices of others, human and non-human, that were made for us, to have water that is safe to drink and to shower with, that gives life to all life. But I hardly know even the basics. Before the city built sewage and water pipe systems, New Yorkers relied on wells that tapped underground streams for drinking water. During the Revolutionary War, British troops destroyed an attempt at a reservoir on the outskirts of the city. In 1835, a fire broke out so massive uh, that it could be seen from Philadelphia. And it took two weeks to put out the fire because we lacked water. So New Yorkers looked for alternate sources of clean water and went 30 miles north and found the Croton River. The Croton water system hired mostly Irish immigrants fleeing the potato famine to build a reservoir in 41 mile aqueduct to carry its water south. It altered the landscape of Westchester County, built High Ridge over the Harlem River, and terminated at the Yorkville Reservoir in what is now Central Park. And apparently, when it was completed in 1842, the parade was over five miles long. Um, so our water supply is extraordinary and our demand even more so. In 1905, the New York Water Board formed and to build up our water, city's water supply, we flooded towns. Olive, West Shokan, Broadheads Bridge, Brown Station, building more dams, reservoirs, and aqueducts in the Catskills. <coughs> um, more than 4,000 residents lost their homes, their businesses. Some were compensated, some were not. And then by the 1930s, that wasn't enough. So. We moved from the Catskills to the Delaware River and its tributaries. And the US Supreme Court upheld our right to tap the Delaware's water up to 440 million gallons a day. And that was very little. So we scaled back our plans and forced another 4,000 people to vac vacate their homes in Eureka, Montella, Black Rock, Arena, Pacton, Shatterton, and Union Grove. Beerston, Cannonsville, Brockwift, Rock Royal, Branton, Never Sink, Bittersweet. 2,371 bodies were removed to be reinterred elsewhere. We drowned homes, farms, forests, and still pollution rendered the Cannonsville Reservoir unusable. This doesn't account for the damage we unleashed upon the original peoples, just the damage that we planned, we documented. In 1799, Aaron Burke called the Manhattan Water Company to sell uptown water downtown. Now we take the waste produced downtown back to uptown to the North River Water Pollution Control Plant, which is nearby. Um, as Cecil Corbin Mark and West Harlem Environmental Action quit, when Robert De Niro flushes his toilet in Tribeca, Harlem deals with it. This despite the fact that the pollution control plant is on high ground in Hamilton Heights, and it also operates by gravity. So something there doesn't quite make sense. Today, a billion gallons of water per day travels through our city's mains and pipes. Things change not because of a change of heart, but because of our fiscal crisis in the 70s. And one random fact that perhaps is not poetic at all, but it's like, what? Um, we were the very last major American city to install water meters and to try to save water in general because we've always had these supplies. And there was apparently a program in the 90s, which is so recently, by the city to replace um, toilets. And so we replaced 1.3 million toilets and reduced our water consumption by 25% through toilets. Apparently, this winter had the second lowest amount of snowfall on record. Uh, the reservoirs in the Catskills will be lower than usual this spring until what constitutes usual changes. Given this history, what would it mean to decommodify de water, to begin to do so here in the city, to operate with a logic against economics, to value abundance rather than scarcity? 
colloquially in Mandarin, Tai Sui He means too watery or weak. In Thai, it's important to mean Nam Jai, to have a watery heart, to be kind, to make sacrifices. In both of these phrases, being watery constitutes an erasure of self. Yet in emergent strategy, Adrian Marie Brown exhorts, change is constant, be like water. She quotes Bruce Lee that you must be shapeless, formless like water. When you pour water in a cup, it becomes the cup. Water can drip and it can crash. Rather than simply being subject to governmentalities, to institutional shapes, perhaps water can also teach us modes of furtive engagement with our own imaginaries. I wonder whether there's a strength to water, to being watered down, that perhaps I too have been looking straight through, have been unable to recognize, that it saturates. Humidity exacerbates each extreme ambient condition, a cold damp deep in our bones, a muggy swelter before a thunderstorm. It seeps through our pores, that it is unassuming, life-giving, life-taking, in inescapable. What would it mean for me to try to remember even this brief history each time I turn on my faucet, satiate myself with a sip or gulp of water, to acknowledge the journey each drop that has taken? Whether to believe in a future in the face of the destruction of our earth without being delusional is to embrace the purgatory, to continually work towards real utopias, even as news headlines suggest that most facts dystopian. To take after water is to subvert rational choice theory, austerity, and neoliberal logics whereby resources only become valuable as they disappear, as they become scarce. To take after water is to invert the logic of economics, to work against scarcity and find joy in abundance. That as Brown writes, water seeks scale. Even your tears seek the recognition of community that we will not all move along the same paths, think the same ideas. Loretta Ross writes that if we were do, to do that, we would be a cult. But if instead we were to travel in the same direction, but down diverse tributaries and canals and pipes and clouds, then we move, as in we take the form of a movement. Around boulders and rocks, hard obstacles, we flow through by shape-shifting and navigation more than force. Facing soft obstacles, thick skin, we simply seep in. To take after water is to adapt to contest, but also thirst for depth, for belonging, for social movement, critical solidarity and resistance. To take after water is to believe in cycle after cycle, reincarnation after reincarnation, to imagine extensions of ourselves beyond the horizon. Water instructs me that when we are all relations, the future is estuary. Some people will say we are the water people, and some 
of people will say we are island people. And the difference in that is whether we are the fluid between or the pockets isolated. And so my poetics um, really kind of takes this approach of building relationships and through water doing that with language and with the idea of currents and with the ideas that even though my family is grown up on the East Coast as far away from our traditional lands and culture as we could, um, water also kind of trans traverses the, the globe. I was trying to find a current specifically that neatly connected the East Coast from Pennsylvania to uh, the Aleutian Islands and they don't like to work that way. <laughs> That's the circuit is nature. It's, it's you, there's no doubt that the water makes its way everywhere through condensation, through storms, um, through all these different ways, but never in the way that you're expecting and never in the way that you want it to. And I mean, that for me is, is all about poems. You kind of start with the notion, you start with an idea. For me, it's I look up a word and then suddenly I'm faced with five other words and these micro essays that have me thinking in all sorts of directions I wasn't expected to go. So they all kind of lead back to themselves and in waves and, and pulses. I think that um, my main experience of water, besides the ones I described in that talk, were um, was my mother constantly soaking in the bathtub. So that's how I sort of ended up coming up with this idea of pity the bathtub, its forced embrace of the human form. And I think that like in terms of how I wrote some of those poems, I think what I do admire in water and sort of relates to what you were talking about is the way it can encounter a boundary and reverse and move. And so I found myself in that book writing poems that I wanted to be kind of breathless and quick, and also that just kept, they would come to the end of the line, but that end of that line, that last word would start another sentence, so they were impossible to read out loud. But there was this idea that I was kind of trying to break out of the way that I sometimes think water gets contained. Um, I, I grew up at, first in Sao Paulo and Brazil, so, and then on the East Coast here, so always near the ocean, and yet my parents didn't know, they don't know how to swim, and, um, and I'm sort of hydrophobic, I can sort of swim, um, but I, and then, and without the history of my family there, and so, so, Coming from an immigrant experience, I didn't grow up um, really thinking about where we're from, but how different folks can belong where they are, um, and and thinking about water with both this intimate familiarity and this distancing feeling of foreignness at the same time, and that, but then also really knowing that water is so inextricable part of a place, like I always notice when I take a shower, like how hard or soft is the water, you, you, just, you just notice that you are or are not home or wherever you're most used to. And, and then also because I'm really into, um, into cities and, and urban, and just urban policy type stuff. I always wonder what the infrastructure is and how we try to render something organic, technically controllable, and what the ramifications of that are and how it just comes up every day. But it was so hard to think about <laughs> water because it is so immense that, yeah, I think that I did have to think through a personal connection to even begin to try to say anything. And I know that um, there is that question, you know, can poets save the planet, <laughs> which you all talked about. Um, and, um, yeah, <laughs> optimistic or pessimistic, I don't know. But um, I know that you said, Abigail, you know, that poets can't save the planet, but we can shape the narrative. So just wondering how you all feel, you know, we can do that. What are ways that we can shape the narrative? Is it by writing poems or are there other things we can do, um, you know, that is uh, special to us as poets that only we can do in that way to, to change the narrative? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, I mean, poems are the obvious go-to because it's what we do, it's what we're better at. Um, it's, it's 
always, it's always an interesting adventure for me to come to these panels because I went into writing specifically because I didn't like public speaking. <laughs> uh, in college, if there was a class that required an oral presentation and I didn't need that class to graduate, I would not take that class. I was that afraid of it. And so writing for me has always just been where I go to to get the thoughts down, but then also to have that material to play with, um, have that raw image to transform. And so, I mean, definitely multi. I mean, even uh, HD had said that you know she meant the break in time. Like I kind of see that as where where we are right now, trying to, for me personally, trying to incorporate. Uh, raising awareness for missing and murdered indigenous women, raising awareness for the, the threat to languages and the extinction of languages, and what does it mean to lose a language? And that means that we're also losing that perspective. Um, the, the words that I put up on the screen there, all of those words that circle for water, I mean, there's always the joke that, oh, Eskimos have hundreds of words for snow. And, and those languages, those unique languages, they do have a lot of words for snow because that's what they're paying attention to. That's what their perception is filtered through. That's what their comparisons are. It's similar to how water, how nostrils are feel like things, and how does that relate us as humans to the water, and how does that return us to the water. And so by paying attention to these aspects of language, I think it really does um, make us aware of the broader connections that we might not otherwise think of. Um, like with uh, I'm not trying to make this morning so depressing, but like with, with the relationship to the crisis of um, missing women in indigenous populations and urban populations, a lot of it comes down to misinformation and lack of awareness and lack of jurisdictional communication and all of these ways that we try to isolate communities and isolate history as this past objective moment in time that now we have literally moved away from as opposed to a circuitous kind of experience, um, it creates these false divisions that make it much harder to tackle the situation than when you realize that I can be a poet and I can speak of these things and I don't necessarily have answers, but I can present something who might have the capacity for those answers to come across things. So with my first book, it was about Russian American history in the Aleutian Islands. Growing up in Pennsylvania, I didn't hear that history and I hated history class. Like it was, just rote memorization. But when you turn it into a narrative, you turn it into something that people can relate to on a more emotional level, and you turn it into something that, um, like our country is very much an example of facts and rationality is not what people operate by. Um, we don't make decisions. We don't turn out to vote based on statistics. We turn out to vote, we turn out to make change based on these visceral reactions. And if you can have a narrative that speaks to somebody about a topic, and you can connect them in that way, you can then inspire that change. I think dovetailing off what you just said, um, I was thinking of uh, some climate scientist protests, um, one of their placards that I've seen, um, they were protesting in an oil pipeline and it was a placard that said, um, what do we want? Um, Evidence-based policy. When do we want it? After peer review. And it would, and I mean, we have documentation out there. Do we really need to prove that more money would help low-income schools? That climate change exists. And we um, we have good evidence on most of these pressing issues and. We need compelling narratives. And to me, poetry is pivotal in that, and also in highlighting contradictions and different perspectives, because it, it's the, you, unless you're working with concrete poetry, I guess you still bring one word after another, and it's still hard sometimes, unlike visual art sometimes, to, to present different perspectives all at once, but, um, and because it has to follow some sort of linear, linear fashion, but much more than fiction or other genre, uh, other modes of writing, it really, it really highlights complexities. And to me also, it, 
it's so hard to break out of the very narrow ways of being and imagining that institutions tell us to be. And if we can just defy those categories and imagine something new, that's that's in, that would be incredible to me. Yeah. <laughs> We are in the PC's view right now. Is water. Where are the spices? Spices era. Yeah. And going to the Aquarius era. Just, I don't know anything about astrology, but now we are in the water era. I was wondering when I, on the plane I was thinking. That's true. It was very well timed, this book. <laughs> recognize 
where our things come from and where the water and other things we use go that um, that landfills are are piling up with even our recycling materials because no we can't just send them to other low-income countries to for them to take it they're starting to refuse New York City's recyclables um, that that everything we do has consequences. I think it's not like we, it's not, but it's also overwhelming for most of us. I don't know what to do on a daily basis. So there's something to, to recognition and movement and collective decision making in terms of priorities and awareness because and I'm still a believer in narrative and conversation that if we were to, to really be somehow face to face with someone suffering the consequences downstream, literally or figuratively, very few of us would maintain this uh, with our typical MO. Most of us would say, I need to do something about this. But it's really hard to when we're kept unaware, and there are people profiting off of our ignorance right now, um, and when we are not connected and we don't know the movement. You're just asking the question, I mean, who would have thought that a Saturday morning panel on poetry would get us thinking about the sewage dumping in the Hudson? <laughs> it's not your typical poetic image, but um, in that, immediately makes me think of um, poetry as survival and poetry as, yeah, it seems like a small gesture, I mean, in the, in the way of things, and, and by itself, not able to save, save anything, but it allows an individual that moment of sanity, that moment of peace, to really think about things, and then that allows you to communicate with someone else and get other people having the discussion, and so, I mean, I'm thinking of taking that, and it's like, okay, well, what are different survival adaptations that other species, like let's, let's de-anthropize, anthropos, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, let's, anthropomor let's de-anthropomorphize, <laughs> you know, I was missing a syllable, uh, let's de-anthropomorphize that and, and understand that, um, you know, there's a history of flood narratives across cultures, it's not like these catastrophic events don't take place, We've just kind of been in this fortunate blip of history where you haven't experienced one in a while, or at least, you know, we here haven't. Tidal waves and tsunamis, other people have had that devastation. Um, but even that, right, it's hard for us to bring that into our collective, like these, the different tsunamis that have hit Thailand, earthquakes, and um, I can't process that amount of carnage and destruction in a single uh, event of un human-made, like an act of God kind of thing. It's, it's hard for me to even fathom that level of destruction, yet it happens to others. And so poetry becomes one way of how do I put myself in that position? How do I look at how other species are affected by these things? And how are they adapting? And how are they surviving? And you know, is there something to be said for it? It's not necessarily always the answer. It's not always that I'm going to write this poem that's going to give us an answer. I'm going to write this poem that's going to make someone think about it. And the answer might not be what you want to be. The answer might just be that you're not here, but the planet survives. It's like that book, The World Without Us, right? Yeah. If you'll bear with the prosaic uh, question on a poetic occasion, there was an image on the screen that I was intrigued by. It was a large landscape with circular shapes, which at first I thought were bubbles, and then I thought maybe were pollutants or something. Uh, could you uh, elaborate on that image? I think that was, there a sea otter in that photo? Was it like a water skiing? Um, it was a large landscape with, with yeah. does anybody else know what I'm referring to with these circular forms? In my limited experience with PowerPoint, <laughs> once I had a theme, I could not break out of that theme without starting over. And so a lot of those were, were, bubble, were water bubbles. Um, 
just kind of playing with the idea of water in my presentation and his, and his background, um, and just having the, the water splash on there. But one of the pictures also had um, kelp beds, which actually also have these like bubble kind of um, in, inflatable type globular components to them that float on the water. But it's interesting that you put it in the context of a pollutant because, yeah, it's not necessarily water. It could be a pollutant. And it comes back to that question of perspective and um, and where a person is coming from is how they would interpret a photo differently. I see, because it almost seemed to have a metallic kind of quality, and they were in the sky, you know, which was in the background. So anyway, it's quite interesting. Thank you. Um, a lot of you spoke about belonging and being from places and the idea of like belonging to land. Um, I just would like to hear how you would think about like the idea of people belonging to water. Well, I, I tend to write a lot about hybrids and I've tried to stop, but I'm not able to stop. And part of my attraction to mermaids is that they kind of belong to both. Um, the idea that your lower half is water and your upper half lives in the, in the air. And so I think about, I never think about belonging entirely to water, but I think about belonging half and half. And I think there's this kind of comfort we often feel when we are in the water. Um, but then I think also that idea of dividedness is kind of part of being human, like feeling divided in identity, feeling parentage, and nationality, all those things. So I think that's kind of where I Belonging for me has kind of been a, a source of tension, as I said, just from my family's history of displacement and with all of the different politics and bureaucracy that goes into um, how we allow indigenous people to identify and how we expect indigenous people to identify and how that's supposed to make itself manifest, how you fill out forms on a questionnaire, um, all of these different choices that you make and that seem made for you. And so with, with my work, you know, a lot of it comes down to motives especially. I'm constantly questioning my motives for returning to my culture, for returning to my heritage, for returning to that material in my palms. Am I doing it justice? Am I doing it so respectfully? Um, which I guess, in answer to your question, kind of brings in belonging. I think of belonging to water um, in this way of reciprocity. So I identify as belonging to this place, but it's not just a passive belonging. For me, it's taken quite a bit of work and quite a bit of um, constantly trying to bridge that relationship and bolster that relationship and find ways of giving back and not just taking from, from what I learned. And so um, my own relationship comes down to a lot of displacement and a lot of kind of wandering away and coming back and so the sort of motions of water. I guess I also was thinking of belonging in water more figuratively in terms of um, I was really taken when I first read um, Emergent Strategy by Adrian Marie Brown um, and, I, and I study social movements but this is a book that was recommended to me by a lot of activists and I thought that was really interesting um, and water is a major theme in this book in terms of building critical solidarities through water and what it means to come together and also thinking about how each droplet can do something but together it ends up building really complex movements and systems that no single droplet could have imagined and in terms of belonging and water I've been thinking a lot more about that than in thinking about um, geographic, specific geographic bodies of water. Well, <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess that, that will be 
conclude this um, panel. Thank you so much, um, Nina and Abigail and Matita, um, for being here. And um, this is not the end of today uh, at all. <laughs> um, so there will be, a, I'm not sure what time it is, but there will be a, a panel coming up um, at 1 p.m. And it will be um, C.A. Conrad, Luna Miguel, and Philippe Williams. And it's called The Eternal Lake. So take with that what you will. Um, so uh, please come back when, that, when it's time for that, however many minutes that is now. Okay.